Hi, I'm delighted to be here today to talk to you about this summer's journey of a 50-foot superconducting electromagnet from New York to Fermilab, right here in our backyard. And I'll describe to you how we're going to use that magnet to look for new physics that we haven't seen before. 2012 was a very exciting year for particle physics. On the 4th of July, scientists at the Large Hadron Collider in Geneva, Switzerland, announced the discovery of a new particle, the Higgs boson. This particle had been hypothesized for 50 years, and it really represents the last piece of the puzzle that physicists refer to as the standard model. With it, we describe everything that we can see in the visible matter in the universe in terms of some fundamental particles called quarks and leptons, as well as some forces. And now the Higgs showed up to tie this all together. Despite the immense success of this particle and this model to describe everything that we know about, there are still some really big questions out there. And we can look to the cosmos to see what they are. So in the 90s, scientists looked out into the universe and saw that not only was the universe expanding, but the rate at which the universe was expanding was increasing. That is to say, the expansion of the universe was accelerating. We don't know what sort of particle or force causes this, and we dub this expression dark energy. We don't know what it is. When we look out at galaxies and see the way that light bends around those galaxies, we know that there's more mass in those galaxies than we can account for by visible matter. We dub this, this extra mass that's in there dark matter. We don't know what that is. And third, we don't even know why our universe is made out of matter instead of antimatter, which were both abundant in the early universe. One month ago today, Peter Higgs and Francois Englert won the Nobel Prize in Physics for their prediction of the Higgs boson, which we found last year. And at the uh, Nobel announcement, this image was shown, which rearranges all of those particles I showed you in that table that are part of our standard model, centered around the Higgs. And what we can see is that everything that we really know how to describe about the universe can actually be thought of as a much smaller piece in a much bigger puzzle. So we'd like to have ways to look out there and find new particles that help us fill in the rest of that puzzle. So take this illustration as, a, as sort of an analogy that we can use to look for evidence of new particles out there in the universe. This character that's blowing on the ship represents the new particle. Now, as scientists, what we'd like to do is create a machine where we can produce those particles and study them and hold them in our hands. But sometimes that's not possible. And instead, we have to use a different technique to look at the effect of those particles, the same way we can look out at the trees and see them bending over and to do something about the wind that's pushing them. So that's what we do with this particle called the muon. It's a perfect candidate for this because we know a lot about it. You can think about a muon basically as an electron with two minor differences. The muon has a mass that's 200 times that of the electron, and it decays very quickly in only two millionths of a second. It decays to an electron and to two neutrinos. It also has this property called spin, which means that you can think about it as a little spinning top or a gyroscope. And if you put it in a magnetic field, the muon will process around and around. Now, the quantum world is a really strange place. There are particles that are popping in and out of existence all the time. And the muon is a probe that can sense those particles popping in and out of existence. And they affect the way that the muon spins around in this magnetic field. Now, we know what the particles that are in that table do to this muon as it, as it precesses. Okay? But if we, do, if we carefully study the muon as, as it goes around, we can learn something about what else the muon sees. And we can determine if it's able to see particles that we don't know about yet, that are not part of that puzzle yet. So if we return to this, uh, this wind analogy, where the universe is trying to tell us something of, um, of a new particle via some, some effect, right? the muons are really like little windmills. They can catch that information and do something with it. And if you have a whole bunch of muons together, you can learn something really profound about the universe. So I want you to think of these muons really as little historians that go out there and experience the world, and then two millionths of a, se a second later when they come back to us, uh, as, the, as they die on their deathbed, they tell us their story and tell us what they experienced and what they saw out there. So that brings us to the muon G-2 experiment. 
Um, the G in that experiment stands for gyromagnetic ratio, which is basically the way that the muons go around in this magnetic field. And the image here shows the experiment as it was set up in Brookhaven National Laboratory in New York uh, re recently. And the muon race around underneath this white section of the magnet where there's a very strong magnetic field. You can basically think about it as a 50-foot racetrack for muons that are going almost the speed of light. Now, the way that we create this magnetic field is by winding a superconducting coil around and around and cooling it down. It produces a field that's about 1.5 Tesla, which is 20,000 times the Earth's magnetic field, or roughly what you would experience if you were inside of a, an MRI machine. Now, when scientists decided that we wanted to do this experiment at Fermilab because we had the right resources to do this better and look for new particles, we considered building one of these from scratch, but that would cost 20 to $30 million. So instead, we had the crazy idea that we could go to New York, take it apart, pick it up, put it on a truck, drive it to a boat, put it on a boat, and ship it here. And that's exactly what we did this summer. Let me tell you about that. So basically, there's this big coil that's in these, these boxes here, um, and we needed a way to really hold it in place. This thing is really fragile, and if it bends or twists and flex more than a few millimeters, it could snap and be rendered useless for our experiment. So we had to really fix it in place. And so we used these rigid structures to hold the entire ring in, an, in a nice plane. Um, this is what it looks like in the building. We built up this structure around the, the ring, and then when everything was in place, we built a, a, track, a, a train track for it to slide out of the building through this mail slot so that we could get ready for its journey. Um, throughout the journey, a lot of people asked us, is that a UFO? And we said, no, it's a real science experiment. And uh, I guess I really can't blame them uh, looking at this picture, why they'd have that idea. All right, so this is the magnet, a beautiful shot from above uh, where you can see these rings that hold the superconducting coil in silver. And then in the center are the red support structures that keep everything in place and keep it from flexing. The next step was to put on a protective shrink wrap to make sure that uh, no debris or salt water and things got into the, into the magnet to damage it. And we put it onto a trailer that had 64 wheels with eight independent axles. So as it went across the ground, it basically looked like a, a little caterpillar dealing with all the potholes, of which we know there are many here in Illinois. Um, and so this whole contraption itself is about 100,000 pounds. And uh, we started moving it from the laboratory down the road. And, and this is a logistic nightmare. You have to make sure you take get rid of all of the uh, light posts and signs, and I think every marker here on this road indicates something that had to be moved, and you have to do this the entire way uh, that it's traveling. So you get an escort down the road, and uh, we headed towards the port. At the port, we craned the magnet off of the trailer and onto a barge. You'll notice that the magnet is actually above the surface of the barge. There's only three cans connected to the barge, and the magnet is connected to those cans. And that's because as different parts of the boat were moving up, up and down uh, due to waves, we didn't want it to go uh, and get twisted and torqued. So three points to find a plane. So no matter the way the surface of the boat moves, the magnet would stay in a nice plane. And you can also see the nice trailer with all of its wheels and its glory there. So this is the route that we took from New York down around the coast towards Miami. Um, we actually stopped in Norfolk, Virginia for four days because there were threats of inclement weather, and we just didn't want to risk it with such a sensitive device. But once we uh, got going again, we zipped around Miami, up across the Gulf of Mexico to Mobile, Alabama, and onto the Tennessee Tom Bigby Waterway, where we then hooked up with the uh, Mississippi River and eventually the Illinois Waterway. Now, the Illinois part of the journey uh, took three nights, and we went from Lamont, Illinois, to Bolingbrook, to Glen Ellen, to Fermilab. Uh, the whole journey itself started in, in the end of June this summer and completed at, at the end of July. So it took about one month to, to bring the magnet here. So this is what it looked like uh, being exchanged from the ocean tugboat to the river tugboat right near Mobile, Alabama. And this is what it looked like closer to home in uh, Joliet as it was going through the locks. And we had a lot of opportunities for people to come out and talk to us and learn what was going on. Finally, we made it to Lamont where we reinstalled the crane, lifted the magnet up, put it back on the trailer, and got ready for the road portion in Illinois. Now, the logistics were a little more complicated here because we actually needed to close down the highways, and the only time the IDOT wanted us to do that was uh, late at night. 
So you can see this shot at about one in the morning coming up uh, the I-355 from Bolingbroke towards, towards Glenellen, rolling about 10 miles an hour so that we don't, so even if any of those bumps occur, we don't uh, damage the magnet. And the final leg took it uh, on the I-88 and brought it to Route 59 and eventually Fermi Lab uh, on, some ba on some back roads. Every day uh, while we were waiting for the roads to be closed so we can move the next leg, we uh, had opportunities for people to come and talk to us and ask us questions. Some people were interested in the science. Other people had heard about this cool trailer that was designed on their trucking blog. Other people just walked out of the store or saw a whole bunch of cars and wondered what the heck it was. And we were really excited to be able to tell them. So it was really an amazing thing. There was so much anticipation, and we invited the community out to come see the magnet. And this happened uh, right at the end of July of this, of this year. So for me, as a scientist, it was really inspiring to see so many people that were interested in the science, that were curious about what was happening in their backyard. And I think really that's the essence of what science is and what we're doing here. I mean, it's what you guys are doing here. You're expressing curiosity in our community and what's going on. So our team is really excited to get to the business of reassembling this magnet and doing the experiment to search for new particles that are out there in the universe. And I hope that you'll stay tuned and listen and find out if we find the next piece of that puzzle. I thank you for your curiosity and for your attention.